make sure you click the link to subscribe to my YouTube channel and also click the notifications button to be notified for when my next podcast goes live. You can also follow me on my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest is. I hope you enjoy this week's episode. Thank you. Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Neil Woods. Neil's a former undercover copper for 14 years. First of all, Neil, I just want to thank you for coming on the show. No problem. I think this is the first time I've sat across from a copper and I'm the one that's asking the questions today. So it's refreshing. <laughs> um, so you've released two books. You went undercover, some dark topics you've went worked on. Um, we'll go right back to the start where you grew up and how you got involved in the life you were involved in. Yeah, well, I grew up um, in, I suppose you could call it a sleepy middle-class town called Buxton in um, the Peak District. And But I, I didn't really realise at the time how sheltered it was, but I made a bit of a daft mistake. Uh, I went to university by mistake, and why I thought that I would enjoy business studies, I have no idea. But I quickly found out it wasn't for me, and I dropped out. So I went home. I was going to go backpacking around Europe. Uh, a couple of my friends had done that. It sounded exciting. But then I saw an advertisement in the local newspaper for the police. And I thought, well, that sounded exciting too, but I couldn't make my mind up, so I flipped a coin. And it came up heads, and that's why I applied for the police. So I suppose you could say I was literally flippant about it. Sort of flipping other coins, basically. Put your life in that path. Yeah. Sometimes that's the best way to deal with things, just flip the coin and roll with it. So when you first joined the police, how long did it take before you went undercover? Well, it's about four years, but I mean, I was really crap as a uniform cop. I was terrible. You know, I couldn't deal with conflict. I couldn't work out why people still wanted to keep punching me when I was trying to calm them down. Um, I just, you know, I just didn't realise how sheltered I'd been. Did you see a lot of violence towards yourself at the start as being on the beat? Yeah. I mean, you know, uniform police have to put up with violence all the, all the time. Um, but it was just, it was just a bit of a culture shock to me. So I almost lost my job a few times, to be honest, uh, but I clung on there. But and then after four years, there was the mother of all moral panics about, about drugs. And the reason for that is that the tabloid newspapers, the media, were constantly publishing stories about crack cocaine in America for years before we actually had any. So the moment it hit the streets in the UK, the general public were already scared. So the Home Office reacted overreacted and invested huge amounts of money in drugs policing. That meant I could get an attachment to the drug squad. Now the drug squad hated having us rookies around. They really did. But one of them sort of looked at me one day and said, uh, do you fancy having a go at buying some crack? And I mean, that wasn't a question I was expecting. As you, you do. <laughs> yeah, as you, as you do. Yeah. Um, and I says, well, yeah, I'm game for anything. Um, and so he gave me 20 quid, went to this terrace house, knocked on this door and this huge guy came to the door and, uh, quite quickly agreed to sell me some crack. And he was quite nice, actually. <laughs> he, he said, uh, he said, you know, you take care, don't get yourself arrested. And so I came back to the drug squad there hold, holding my little stone of crack. I've got it. Look, but, um, but that day then defined the next 14 years of my life because I was young and I was quite calm when I was doing that kind of work. Um, so one day turned into several weeks doing it, then several months, because it was a new tactic. It hadn't been done in Britain before. So, but, you know, people go to prison, they talk to other people and suddenly they know. They, they know that there's, there's a new thing out there and there are cops pretending to be drug users. So it got more and more difficult. And so I couldn't go to any inner city area without spending six months there because I would have to win people's trust, you know, build a legend um, and work my way up to get the introductions. Why did the drug squad not like the rookies? Because they were a professional unit. They were seasoned detectives. They knew what they were doing with surveillance. They had a sort of slick way of running. And having these, having these rookies just sort of given to them, 
you know, to learn a few things, we were, we were a bit of a pain in the ass to them, really, yeah. getting underfoot. Why do you think they picked you to go forward and pretend to be a drug user? Did you have a certain look or body shape or were just young and naive that you'd agree to do anything? <laughs> yeah, possibly that, yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I was a young, skinny lad and I and I looked actually a lot younger than, than, I, than I was. I was only 23, but I must have looked about 19. Um so it, it, they, it was just a choice, just a chance sort of suggestion, you know, because it, it, it really was a new tactic. It hadn't been done before. I thought it, that kind of stuff had been done for many, many years. Well, higher end undercover work had been done where uh, informants would introduce a, a high a high end, you know, someone to further up the ladder uh, to do a big deal or something like that. And they might spend two years doing it. But actually... Starting at the ground level and working your way up. That hadn't happened in the UK. So how deep did you have to go then? See, when you have when you go undercover, do you get a, a free pass to basically do anything? Like take drugs, sleep with people, or fight? Do you get the pass just to get the in with the high the profile to go deep and build the trust? Because if you're say you're undercover and somebody had slight suspicion, he's at a party, somebody puts out a bit of coke or ecstasy. And if you kind of go, nah, I don't want that, would that bring suspicion to the the criminal's basically mind and go, he's fucking dodgy? Well, I mean, it could do, but it's, it's it's about managing it. Thankfully, I never had to take any heroin, never had to take any crack. Crack wouldn't have worried me particularly, but I never had to. Um, I, I did have to take uh, amphetamine once, but that was because I made a really stupid mistake. Um, I, I made myself out to be a connoisseur of amphetamines. And so this this um, gangster was involved in this car thefts and antique burglaries and stuff. And one day he said, oh, you, I've got a present for you. And he held up this little see-through bag with this toxic looking pink goo in it. You could smell it even through the bag. It smelled like the, the urine from a glue sniffing cat. It was smelled disgusting. It really did. But the thing is, I, went, I was momentarily wary and he could see that mm. glimpse of, of sort of um, wariness. And uh, so I knew, because I'd seen him notice that, I knew I had to take some. I'd be in trouble if I didn't. So there's been, there's, there's moments what like was that. that? It was, it was amphetamine, but it was base amphetamine. Mm -hmm. And at the time, the average purity of, of speed was 5%. This was 40%. Mm -hmm. So I stuck my little finger in, had a little bit. Um, <laughs> and he says, no, you'll need more than that with your tolerance. <laughs> I think, okay, so I've got, I've got a load more. And I you know, hit my stomach and that warm feeling. Down there. And, uh, you know, within 20 minutes, I was out of it. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, really out of it. And, it. and it was the most horrible angsty feeling. I mean, I knew enough about amphetamine. You, you know, you need to take quite a lot to overdose. So I wasn't particularly worried. But, but I didn't sleep, really, for three nights. Three nights. So how does that... Are you, mind you, my house has never been so tidy. Yeah, so... <laughs> How does that work then? If you're going to take some speed, you know you're going to be tripping balls. Do you speak to people at the office or how do you judge that? Do you go to the hospital? So what kind of procedure do you have to deal with when you take it? Well, I have a, I have a cover person, you know, someone supposedly looking after my welfare. He just got me driven home. I assured him I didn't need to go to the hospital. Um, I know you, take, you need to take a lot of amphetamine uh, to overdose. So I wasn't overly worried. Uh, but I got home and I'm, you know, I was being driven home and on the way home, I'm thinking I've got eight cans of Stella in the fridge. That'll sort me out. That'll calm me down. Oh. Now I finished the eighth one and I felt no different at all. <laughs> so you says that you wouldn't be scared of taking heroin. Uh, you would be scared of taking heroin, but not crack. Why is that? Um, well, I mean, heroin, I, I wouldn't know. Um, it's it's too easy to overdose with heroin, you know, and, and I wouldn't have been the first time, you know, you take tiny amounts the first time. Um, so just, just, just find it a really scary drug, but crack, I wouldn't find as scary. It's quite hard to overdose on it. So obviously when you started to find your feet and really go into the uncharted waters, what was your first big job then as an undercover cop or to, to get information and get a conviction? Oh God, the first one. Ooh, well, I mean, there were so many early on. Um, I suppose the first really, the first huge one, the really six month one was in, was in Leicester. And um, it, I, I primarily went into this area of Leicester called Highfields, uh, which is a sort of typical sort of post-industrial inner city terraced housing area. 
you know there's lot there's lots of them similar around around uh, the UK and um I mean it, it involved six months worth of buying drugs from various different people I mean there was a few scary moments with that one there was one in particular where two rival gangs um got their heads together and realized I'd been buying off all of them and you know it's not necessarily normal for someone to sample every single dealer's products mm -hmm. when you you know you could have a, a relationship with someone who could meet you every day you know so so they got suspicious and, and one time they 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 waited for, for myself and lined up along this wall and when i saw them i realized that the two rival gangs were together i was in some serious trouble here thankfully i was with a fellow undercover cop who uh a girl who managed to defuse it and um started pulling me away saying leave it leave it as if i was getting to get aggressive with them um it, it was a sort of just a trick that she thought up at the time really did it work it, it, it did work it did um and also I, I didn't show out i didn't um because they had doubts but they weren't convinced mm -hmm. and as long as you stay in in character and as long as uh, you don't ever admit it, that, that's the sort of golden rule. Really. So is it, there's a bit of acting come into play also, or is it more just like role play as well? How much, when you go into character, how much do you need to change completely? Does it affect you also when you finish work? Well, we didn't have training for a long time. Uh, when And I helped design some of the original training, but we had some level one, some long-term undercover cops, teachers, and they said that it's important you're not an actor and don't try and be an actor. You have to play a different version of yourself. Because if you're an actor, you're playing a role on a stage or a part in a film or something, and you can maintain that role. But if you're undercover, you could be amongst people for you know 20 hours. You could be living in a community with them. So if you try and act, it's, you can soon be seen through. But because you're living that thin veil difference, you're being a different version of yourself, yeah, you, you, know, you can find yourself um taking it home um but i, th I think I'm, i always managed to separate work and and home life and i still managed to get home and take my kids swimming on a sunday morning yeah. a lot of the time so where you grew up and then obviously getting moved around to go undercover did you ever notice anybody that you knew or did you ever become suspect that like, oh i know him he's a copper did did you have to go further afield so you wouldn't be recognised? Oh, yeah, I travelled all over the country. I didn't go anywhere near where I lived. Uh, so I worked as far south as Brighton, uh, as far north as Leeds, uh, and lots of places uh, in between. Is there anybody who you became really close with that you maybe got a conviction with and you felt maybe sorry for? Yeah, there's, there's lots of them, to be honest. There's a guy called Cammy in, um, in Nottingham, and... When I got there in Nottingham, I was there to infiltrate a gang called the Berg sorry, the gang a gang called the Bestwood Cartel, run by a gangster called Colin Gunn. And it took me I, I had to pick on somebody to manipulate. And what you do as an undercover cop is actually to pick on the most vulnerable people. For one, they're the most easy to manipulate, but also vulnerable people tend to be using more drugs, so they have more contacts, they know everybody. So this particular guy, he was he was perfect for my purposes because he was on bail for dealing heroin and he was connected to the exact gang that I needed to get close to. And actually I knew, because he was on bail, I knew that um, his life was going to be made worse by me meeting him. I knew that. And this I found really difficult because I had to justify what I was doing, you know, because I was struggled with the ethics of it because I knew he was going to be at risk because if he's the Muppet who's introduced the undercover cop several months later, he's at, he's at risk of getting murdered and at least a, a beating. But also his life's going to be made worse by meeting me because he's on bail, he could get to jail. And he's someone who's a problematic heroin user and needs help. But the, what I did is I justified that to myself because I took the view at the time that the end justified the means. You know, at the end of the operation, I'm going to put loads of gangsters in prison. So to me, that made it, that justified it. So with Cammy, I got to know him. I got him presents. I uh, went shoplifting with him. 
which is great fun, by the way. <laughs> it is. If you, if you know you've got to get out of jail free card, it's such fun, especially if you're working with, some, if, if you're working with someone else and you take it in turns to be lookout. Mm -hmm. It's great fun. Um, but, so yeah. that poor bastard's out with you shoplifting, thinking he's a great shoplifter, not getting touched, not realising that you've got a free pass. <laughs> oh, no, well, well, I still would have got arrested you yeah, know, if, yeah, I got, if, if I'd got caught. caught yeah, yeah, if I'd yeah. got caught, but it's just later on down the line it would have got <laughs> snatched out of court. <laughs> he, would have, he would have still got done, actually. Um, but, would, so, have, would he have yeah, still got yeah, done? Yeah, he would have done, yeah, pro yeah probably. Um, Fucking hell. So I would give him presents, and I really want him over. And, and like I did with most people who were struggling with drugs, I would take the time to listen to them, you know, because I was, you have to show that empathy for people to manipulate them. I suppose I, I called it weaponizing empathy, but in that process, I did really start to understand people because when I went, when I was 19, I went into the police, I saw someone struggling with drugs. I just thought, oh, they're stupid. They've made a mistake and they haven't got the willpower to get out of it. I was very judgmental. Yeah. But then I got to know these people and, um, and Cammy was a, he was a nice bloke, you know, but he'd grown up with a, um, in a, with a traumatic childhood, which is the case with every, sing, every single problematic heroin user I've met and most problematic drug users. Yeah, abandoned they're dealing issues. with yeah, trauma yeah, yeah. or physical abuse. Well, That's I'm, what they're dealing with. I believe that myself. And obviously when you look at it, no matter where you're from, I believe conditioning becomes a big part of it. If you're grown around, um, crime, drink, drugs, violence, it becomes you. And I always say it, you become, it becomes normal. So again, the, the drug abuse it is to numb some sort of pain and feeling. Anybody who's over drinking, overeating, taking drugs, you're hiding from something. You can't face reality. And obviously the excuses come in, but it becomes at a deeper level and understand that you are doing a job, but people do struggle. And I believe everybody has got goodness in them. Everybody mm -hmm. has. And Certain circumstances can trigger it. I, I just made a documentary there in Costa Rica with a plant-based drug called ayahuasca, and they yeah. they call it the the split, the first bit of trauma you have in your life. It's like the soul splits, and that's when we wrap ourselves around and like an onion. We we use the drink, the drugs, the even the violence as a shield to try and fulfil a something that's amiss. So I totally agree with that. The drugs is to numb the pain, and it's sad because. The homeless stuff that we do in Glasgow, when you speak to people, you understand that somebody's son, somebody's daughter, mum, dad, friend, and it, it it can be difficult. So obviously for you looking in, is there an understanding that, okay, these people are lost here and you start to, instead of taking it from the job to get the results and start showing the empathy to go, okay, I really want to help you here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and that, I mean, that was gradual, but, and, and now I realize that criminalizing people who are trying to deal with trauma is literally the worst thing you can do to them. You yeah. know, it's, it's cruelty. It is. Mm -hmm. But at the time I was still wrapped up in the drug war, you know, but Cammy, I, I, I got friendly with him. Um, you know, the, then at the end of the operation, everyone got arrested. Loads of people got arrested. Of course he did as well. He was committing offenses on bail with me. Um, uh, and I found out later that when he was in the police, cells he ended up on minute to minute watch suicide watch and the reason for that is because he thought i was his one friend in the world the, the, the one person he'd found he could talk to and uh, for someone trying to deal with his struggles in life that was the last straw for him yeah and that's what turned him suicidal so it's not even the fact that he's going to prison not even the fact that gangsters may want to kill him it's the fact that the one person who's gave trust to is basically turned against them. Betrayed him. Yeah. yeah, so the abandonment issues kick in, overdrive, then the drug abuse where he just wants to end it. Was, yeah, it's, you can understand that also. So where do you draw the line then to take a job from personal? Is it just go job mentality and go, I'm doing a job here and just try and block that shit out as well? God, I mean, that that hit me like a ton of bricks when I found that out, to be honest. I, um, I thought I've got to give this up stop it instantly you know this is just emotionally devastating um but then two weeks later i got a phone call and um it was a ds who said no oh, look woodsy we need you for this job we need you for this next job because these gangsters are even nastier than the last lot these gangsters are using rape as punishment these they're using rape and maimings as just reputation building you know we've got to stop them and you're the person to do it 
So, you know, I'm a, I was a prime manipulator, but I also got manipulated, you know, and, um, and I swallowed my upset and I went back into it and I still hadn't come to the natural conclusion. I still hadn't joined all the dots, if that makes sense. So even though the other people are going through trauma, you must have went through some sort of mind fuck as well. Did you get treatment for that to try and fo focus on the negative shit as well? Seeing people overdosing, seeing people selling drugs. Did you, because it makes the world look like a bad place. I, there's, I believe there's still goodness everywhere. Um, did you get people you could turn to and speak to and get the help that you needed? No, no, not really. And by that time, I'd been almost killed a few times as well uh, through various operations. Um, they had We had mandatory once a year counselling session. But having had counselling more recently, since I've left the police, I realised that the counselling we had then was a waste of time. It was a, a back covering, an arse covering exercise from the police to say that they'd done it and it was it was worth it was worthless completely do you feel as if you were getting used then at a point to just going out there and sacrifice your mental health and sacrifice your life just to get results absolutely yeah completely um myself and others like like me were just thrown thrown to the wolves really uh, because they were confident they'd covered their back i mean I I haven't I I am now diagnosed legally with PTSD um, and I and I've had some treatment for that but uh, I know I'll never be the same again and and I understand what's caused that is the knowing the harm that I've caused to others and all of those instances where you know I've I've almost died and but carried on working. So what's the worst thing you ever seen while undercover? Worst. I'd be hard pressed to choose one, to be honest, but there was one uh, instance uh, in Northampton where I was um, trying to sort, suss a new dealer to get a new line to to to, to this group, um, just trying to join a few dots. And I, I met up with this guy who, um, who just came up to me and said, are you, are you scoring? Are you going somewhere? And so I said, well, yeah, you know. And he, he said, do you want to share a bag? So I said, right, great, yeah. Another guy suddenly turned up and not seen before. And he says, well, I'm getting a taxi to go and get, who wants to come? I'm paying for the taxi. Fine. And then suddenly there's four of us in this taxi. The first guy that had come up to me, he was completely yellow. Like not even a hint of it, like proper yellow, Simpsons yellow. Probably, I've looked at him thinking he's probably got hepatitis C. Um, one these? Yeah, so he's, he's struggling. So we go to the other side of, of Northampton, uh, score some heroin i'm splitting a bag with this guy because it was just part of my cover story to just manage a half but they said well we're 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 shooting it so we'll have to go to these toilet derelict toilets in the middle of this park so we went to this park because i my story was i was going to take it away and smoke it so as i'm walking to these toilets the yellow guy says oh, i haven't had anything for three days i've been arrested and remanded on custody I'm thinking, looking at the state of him, thinking, so he's got no tolerance and he's going to inject half a bag. I mean, it's the most like it's the most common overdose is when you come out of police custody, your tolerance has gone down. So I was worried about that. And I'm thinking, how far away am, am I from a phone box? I haven't got a mobile phone on me. So then another guy says, right, who's got filters? And they'd only got two filters between three of them. So one guy says, oh, well, don't worry. I just go into my groin. I don't need a filter. I'm thinking, what? That's the worst place to go into your body without without a filter. So, I'm thinking he's gonna he's gonna have an embolism em, embolism embolism. Em, got the word wrong. But he's gonna have a brain bleed. That's the, the other guy. The yellow guy is probably going to overdose, and God knows what he's doing. And so they're all cooking up, and um, the, the yellow guy goes into the back of his hand, and then starts really gouging and nodding. And as he's nodding, he starts wiping his face like this, rubbing and just half unconscious, rubbing all this blood over his face. He's got blood dripping down his face. His face is yellow and I'm worried he's going to die. Then the other guy drops his trousers, using no filter, goes straight into his groin and, in, and injects there. And then the other guy, he's in his hand as well. So I've got spurts of blood from one hand, which I'm stepping out the way that way. Spurts from another one, I'm stepping out the way that way. And there's loads of blood bouncing on the 
on the floor and you see clouds of dust where every blood droplet is falling. And I'm expecting two of them to die. And I'm just watching carefully, thinking, you know, what, what do I do first when they do? And I was working myself up into a bit of a panic, to be honest. Um, and all the time thinking, well, I've got to wrap up my heroin, half, half the bag that I've got. Yeah, that was one of the moments, really. Yeah. But the yellow guy, I, I had rather dark humour with, with the guy who had jaundice. I said, uh, you've got a little bit of something there. It was covered in blood. Mm -hmm. um, but then the other guy says, hey, mate, you're covered in blood. And went, oh, am I? And he's like trying to rub it off. And he's just going like from yellow to pink. Shit. And then we walk out of those those derelict toilets. And he's, have you seen, you've, you've seen people who are walking when they're on heroin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's an odd sort of shuffle, gouching mm -hmm. shuffle, isn't it? So he's like that. The other two, it, it didn't touch the sides. Thankfully, the guy who went into his groin lived to, lived to risk it another day. Mm -hmm. But the things, it's so upsetting to think that the three of them are really very likely to yeah. be dead now. And it's the way you've got to look at it as well. It's like, obviously, being in the police force, but then you're using those people to take drugs to get to a bigger fish, but those people are still human beings. Mm. They're like the pawns of the game that are relevant. It's cluding yourself getting used there you go what happens when your career's finished and then you're walking the streets how has your life been are you still wary do you look over your shoulder are you scared that the people who you've put behind bars come looking for you because now you're very outspoken you're an activist against the drugs against all the drugs that's going about and you've got your books how is your life now that you've finished it all and now you're outspoken and you're basically showing your face oh well i mean i i am still hyper vigilant uh, I didn't used to, I'm quite twitchy now. I didn't used to twitch. Um, I'm always looking after my, over my shoulder. I feel more comfortable if I go somewhere I can sit, I can see the end exit, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not worried about organized crime coming after me. And I've put some serious gangsters in prison, but I'm not worried about them coming after me. Uh, you know, I, I used to give evidence with a, with a pseudonym, be smuggled into court, um, smuggled out with a blanket over my head and stuff. But, but now I've, it's my real name. You know, I tell people I live in Hereford, but no one's coming after me. And the reason is that the violence, the extreme violence that exists within the drug markets with organized crime, that's just part of the business model. That's to protect themselves and their business. It's to reduce their risk. You know, the more intimidating they are, then the less at risk they are because they don't get grassed up. There's no gain for them to come and take revenge on me because that would be a high risk venture with no gain. So, you know, the, the violence that's in the market, it's just, it's just the business model. And it's a business model because the drugs are illegal, because we police it. Yeah. So what's your opinion on gangsters then? What do you see them as? People who are high profile, who are flooding the streets with drugs, crime, prostitution. What do you look at them and see? I see people that are a product of the system. Uh, and you mentioned, you mentioned prostitution, but really the, the, most of, almost all of organized crime really is about the drug supply, the illicit drug supply. Other crimes are possible because of the money that's available from the illicit drug supply. Even the National Crime Agency says that, you know, it's worth, the market is worth 10 billion pounds a, a year in the UK, 10 billion. Now those gangsters only exist because drugs are banned. Organized crime didn't exist because before alcohol prohibition. It was pro the prohibition of alcohol that created organized crime. There was no connection at all between crime and drugs in this country until drugs were banned. So I see a gangster and I see someone who is a natural product of the way we treat drugs. It's a natural product of drug policy. Yeah. So obviously, what about legalizing drugs? It's the only solution. Do you think so? It's the only solution to the problem we've got. As I say, there was no link between drugs and crime beforehand. But did the government want to legalise drugs? Because then if drugs are legalised, the prison system numbers drop. Um, even pharmaceutical drugs, because methadone is a massive problem in Scotland. It's a, it's a drug that, it's, it's just a billion dollar industry as well in itself. Do, do these numbers want to be dropped? Or is it a money organisation where not just criminals are involved in drugs, but also the people who are involved and higher scale, even the police force governments, is there a lot of corruption inside the police as well? Well, I mean, 
that, that there's there's a lot of questions there, but I, basically, first of all, I, I want to point out that legalizing we in in the activism world we tend to try and avoid the word legalize because people people find it a scary word and it sort of gives an idea of a free for all. Well, the thing is, it's a free for all now. It's the wild west out there. It really is. There is no control. The people who decide what drugs, what goes in what drugs, and who they're sold to are organised criminals. It should be licensed premises. So legally regulating drugs is about getting them under control, like we do alcohol. But of course, alcohol could be controlled better. Yeah, of course. But at least you can tweak alcohol regulation. You can do, See, because think, it's regulated. I, I think alcohol is just a big, one of the biggest drugs out there. It's more glorified. It's more sociable, acceptable. It's every second shop. Well, there is clear evidence that it's the most dangerous drug. Yeah, so the very clear. Yeah, yeah, very clear. But the people who don't want legal regulation is organised crime. So the closer we get to legal regulation, there will be pushback from organised crime. And they will use their methods of corruption to try and stop that progression. But as for corruption, well, yeah, I mean, corrup corruption is huge. It's everywhere. It's, it's massive, but... I'll, I'll tell you, um, I mean, I've come into contact with police corruption quite a, quite a lot of times, but perhaps the most significant event I'll tell you about, if if, if you like. Of course. Um, again, if, I'll take you back to Nottingham, where I met Cammy. Cammy introduced me to one of the gangsters who was in the team of Colin Gunn. About four and a half months into the operation. The day after that, two of my backup team uh, went off sick. So I got two new people to, to come onto the team. I met the first one, shook his hand, had no problem with him. The second one shook his hand and the hairs just went up in the back of my neck. And you know, when you've been on the streets day, day after day, feeling at risk, your senses are quite fine tuned. You know, you're really sensitive to body language. And this guy was just wrong. So I spoke to the boss and said, look, boss, I, I can't have this guy knowing what I'm doing. So he excluded them both. So they didn't ask any questions and they, they never found out what the job is about. 12 months later, Colin Gunn is brought down, brilliant work by Nottinghamshire Constabulary. And it was found that that cop that I'd taken exception to, a guy called Charlie Fletcher, was an employee of Colin Gunn. He'd been paid to join the police uh, and he was paid £2,000 a month on top of his police wages for information and bone plus bonuses for good information. By the time I'd met him, he'd been in the police for seven years. Seven years. You can, you know, you can look him up. He's, he's, he's the newspaper stories of his conviction is online. Charlie Fletcher. Now, I have to make something really clear. That kind of corruption can only be paid for by the money from the illicit drug supply. And there's two reasons for that. For one, there's more money in the illicit drug supply than anything else. But two... The way we police drugs creates monopolies. See, police are really good at catching drug dealers. Brilliant at it. They'll catch them day after day. They'll catch twice as many if you give them twice as much resources. They will do. But they never make, they never shrink the market. The market never reduces. Ever. You arrest the drug dealer, you just create an opportunity for another one. Or two more. So, by policing drugs and arresting people, you thin out the competition for the most successful gangsters. And in fact, the best gangsters use police informants to get rid of the competition. The police do the business for them. Yeah. Is there a lot of high-profile gangsters who are snitches? I believe there's a lot of informants out there who don't go to prison because they're also working with the police. Do you see that a lot? A lot of high-profile names giving the police information to keep them off their back, but also jail the competition around them? That's exactly how it works. And in fact, there's a chapter in Drug Wars where we interviewed um, a guy called Frank Matthews, who was a high-profile informant handler in the Met, and he realised the extent of police corruption, and he started reporting on it, whistleblowing. He'd put so many gangsters in prison, he'd chased organised crime all of his career, only went at the point when he started grassing up fellow police officers did he realise his life was in threat. He thought he was going to get murdered. And in fact, he had to be snatched. He had to be taken away and put into witness protection to protect him from corrupt police. So what's the fine line then between entrapment also, if you're sitting at a party or sitting buying drugs off someone or taking it in front of them, where, where has an entrapment charge come into play where 
it's like you're setting it up, but what is entrapment? Where, Entra- is, that, entrapment. is that even a, a thing now? Yeah, I mean, uh, with the rules of undercover policing, um, the, the first instruction you're given, actually, uh, in, in your formal sort of um, instructions for, for a deployment, the number one is you must not act as an agent provocateur, which is what you're talking about, entrapment. And an agent provocateur is where you um, in, incite somebody to commit an offence or an offence which is more serious than they would have committed. So, and that's important, and that's that's about the ethics of undercover policing that you that you don't um, entrap somebody. I did actually once break that rule. Um, it's, it's one of the chapters in in, in Good Cop. Um, there was a burglar who was. Um, burgling old women at night, picking on uh, old age pensioners' flats. Local police knew who it was, but couldn't catch him. Lots of extra patrols. He was brilliant at forensics, Didn't le- never left any DNA, fingerprints, anything. So they thought, well, he's a dealer. He's dealing amphetamine as well and cocaine. So they basically sent me in to see if we could get him off the streets by another means. And I bought a small amount off him and then I talked him up to a kilo and I knew he wasn't capable of a kilo, but to my mind, it was a way of catching him. Um, and so when, when he was seized with the kilo, it was less than 1% pure, uh, which means he'd only got a small amount and he padded it out, padded it out, but he got sentenced on a kilo. Now that was unethical of me, but that is one of the things that goes on um and it's actually one of the reasons why police are very very resistant some police not all police lots of police in the uk are actually calling for drug law reform but there are some police who see the drug laws as just a tool to catch criminals and uh and so that's why you'll find some police are actually resistant to reform yeah so we had a kilo and it was only one percent basically pure yeah, so it's probably and an ounce. Charred, yeah, he's charged with a full kilo. Yeah. Yeah, it's scary because uh, I've had a lot of people on the podcast as well who's been set up with the police who's spent 20 years behind bars and just through um, maybe get stuff planted on them. And they've said to themselves, look, they're no angels, but because they can't catch them, then they set them up with something else. Does that, did that used to happen a lot? That people getting set up and just to get them off the streets? I, I don't doubt it does happen, but that... I haven't, I haven't seen yeah. that particularly. How it's difficult, but anybody that's involved in a life of crime, they always look at the police as a, an enemy. And you can understand that, especially if you've worked on both sides from buying drugs to try to catch them. What's been your biggest bust? Biggest bust? Yeah. Uh, I, I suppose in terms of numbers, numbers, I suppose it was the, it was the burger bar boys in Northampton. Um, because they were a gang from Birmingham who'd taken over the supply in Northampton. And um, at, at the end of that, I think there was there was 96 people arrested. It took seven months. There was 96 people all, in, all involved in the trade. There were six major gangsters from, you know, amongst the Burger Bar boys. And the rest were people who were runners for them and people stashing for them and all, so, all sorts of things. But at the end of that seven months, I knew... I knew I had caught every single person involved in the heroin, crack and amphetamine trade in that town. Every person. And I knew that because there were no more numbers to get. I'd met everybody. Yeah. I knew. So that huge operation uh, involved five different counties of police. It's a huge operation because they wanted to get as many people in one go. And so it was massive and there was newspaper articles about it. And I spoke to the intel guy a week later. He says, yep. We managed to shut down the drug supply in Northampton for two hours. Two hours. That's not even enough time for someone to rattle. Yeah. So, obviously, fighting against the drug war, when you say that, you're nearly 100 people put inside. Somebody else just comes through the ranks and takes the reins. So, do you ever feel you're fighting a fucking lost cause? Well, it took a long time for the penny to drop for me. But that, you know, but you can't dismiss that. You can't dismiss the fact that another organized crime group just came from Birmingham and there was a new number on the streets in two hours. And that organized crime group would have been rubbing their hands together saying, look what the police have done for us. Put the call in, boys. We'll get some extra stuff. We're going to make an absolute killing. So all you're doing is constantly perpetuating the 
the the violence in the yeah, street. It's just a, a vicious circle that do you see a lot that maybe who's someone who's making a lot of money through drugs and maybe seeing someone who's also involved in crime setting them up to get them away so they can move in and obviously they can take over. Oh yeah, I mean there's all sorts of dirty tricks used trying to try and take someone's uh, territory off them all the time and sometimes those dirty tricks just come down to violence and murder but there's always friction because in an unregulated market you're always going to get that you don't get it you know you don't get um a fight between Carlsberg and Heineken or Smirnoff and and you know Jack Daniels you don't because it's regulated but in this unregulated market it's complete chaos now the trouble that I had is when that penny dropped for me and I realized that how futile it was that I might, you know, I might be filling, filling the prisons up full of people, but that wasn't making society safer. There's just more people became drug dealers. More people stepped into that crime. So it's actually increasing crime. So, and also I had to face up to the fact that, you know, from that first guy, I knocked on the door and he said, take care, don't get arrested. Nice bloke. Every year after there, the streets got more violent for 40 every single year. So I had to face up to the fact that actually that's down to me mm -hmm. or people like me. So what do you think the root of the problem is? Obviously, poverty plays a big part where people um, are struggling to make money. So they see crime as a get out cause where they can feed their family. But I always believe in karma. Anybody who I know who's been active or involved in anything dodgy are either dead or in a jail. And that's just facts. That's just, there's no one ever gets out. What would you, what is your advice for anybody who's maybe involved in anything dodgy and think there's no way out? What would you advice would you give them? What have you seen to prove that it ain't a fucking life? Even though you might think you're Billy Big Balls, even in Glasgow you'll see them driving about in their leased cars, their fake Rolexes, and they think they're gangsters. It is a life of misery because everything has a ripple effect. If you're destroying other people's life to benefit your own, it's only going to come back and bite you now. You've got one option, and that's misery. You ain't going to have a good life. I've had a, a lot of serious criminals on this podcast and every one of them will tell you it ain't a life. It will either catch up on you in three years, five years, ten years. It will always catch up on you. What advice would you give for anybody that's maybe involved or maybe thinking about getting involved because they see maybe their uncles or their fathers? Or What advice would you give them for maybe not to take that leap or maybe to change? Hmm. Well... I'm going to answer that question in a slightly un unusual way, if you, if you don't mind. Of course, man. Because there's a great misunderstanding about the cause of crime. Crime is not caused by criminals. It's caused by opportunity, coupled with the lack of opportunity. So, in other words, people who have no uh, other options in, in poor communities are more likely to turn to crime, theoretically. But the most important thing to note is if you're, if you're committing a burglary, you're a burglar, there's very little demand for that crime because there's very few people who are actually willing to commit that crime, break into someone's house. Very few. So if you arrest one person, you reduce that demand for the crime, haven't you? Now, for drug crime, if you arrest someone for a drug crime, you've not reduced the demand in that market. Someone else will take take it take take that place. So you ask what the problem is. There is a difference. There's a massive difference between drug prohibition and all of the crimes. You've got to separate them. The communities being affected by people who are involved in uh, organized organized crime, drug dealing, they're affected because the drugs are banned. They're not regulated. Now. As, as for what, what I would say to people uh, who, who would consider getting into crime, well, most drug dealers I've met, I mean, I've met some top, top of the tree ones, I've met some med middle management and some people can be vicious. Actually, the vast majority of drug dealers are nice people who trade to a small group of people. You know, most people I know will sell cannabis, they're nice people. Most people who sell uh, MDMA, they're just nice people who get it in for their mates at the weekend or for a festival. You know, most people who use drugs do it non-problematically. Most people who sell drugs socially, they're not criminals. They're people who are doing 
a natural human thing, but because the law says they're illegal, they're criminals. So I think it's important to separate this in a conversation. 90% of drug use is non-problematic. So you have to start thinking about, about people who have a problem with drugs as someone who just needs help. And other people, they just need regulated drugs to make it safer. So I know that's not quite what you're after in the, no. in the question, but that there are solutions to our problems in society. And the first solution, the most important one, is, is to regulate the drug markets. If you do that, the police can deal with more serious crime. Then we can start looking at health-based solutions for things because it's actually significantly cheaper to try and look after people than it is to incarcerate them. Well, Scotland's at its all-time high just now. Scotland has just risen 27% with drug-related deaths, so it is massive in Scotland. So it's a concern, it's a worry. I have kids. Um, I know how bad it can be growing up in a rough area. So for me, it's a worry. And for me, people who think it can be cool, I think it's... I, I, for me, and I always say, it, drug is escapism. No matter if it's at a festival, no matter what it is, you can have fun without it. I've took drugs for many years, but looking back on it, it's because I was weak, because I was lonely, because I was scared. I couldn't face reality. It gave, it gave me the courage and the strength to be loud and daft as if I was fine. But looking back, I was vulnerable. So for me, no matter if it's a festival, no matter what it is, no matter if you you can control it, it's still you're still hiding from something. And what do you think, for you working in the drug culture and trying to stop it and try to, did you see any at any moment the crimes going down or the drugs becoming less and less? Because right now I think we're at the peak of crime and drug-related deaths, which is scary. Since drugs were banned, they have got stronger, cheaper and more varied, constantly. When I was buying a, a, a 10 bag of heroin in 1993, for that £10, I would get 0.12%, uh, 0.12 of a gram. Um, and I was paying, 14 years later, I was paying £10 for the same amount. But over that period of time, the drug got significantly stronger. So what other commodity is there that's inflation-proof and gets stronger over time? The reason for that is because the drug is, is an, has an illicit market. We have no control over it. So we have to control things, but I, I, I have to disagree with you that um, about. I mean, I, I took I took a view that any drug use was was a problem or escapism. You know, when I started in the police, and for many people it is. But ninety percent of people who use drugs have no problematic relationship with them at all. So I, I now realise, you know, looking at the evidence, speaking to um, scientists, uh, obviously researching the history of drug policy in the UK. I now realise drug use is actually normal. It's a normal human activity. Should it be normal? Why, why shouldn't it be? Because it's it's taking anything you take externally takes you away from a conscious frame of mind, which is not is not natural. Well, who says it's not natural? But humans have been using drugs for for thousands of years. There's there's various animals use drugs. It's quite a natural. It's a natural existence. It's a natural thing to do. The, but but how could we fight a war on drugs if you're accepting it's okay for people to take it. But we have to learn to live with drugs. But do That's we what don't? we have to do. Well, Should... well, what's the alternative? We, we, we tried banning them and stopping people using them. I don't know. Try and not take them. Again, because it's scary. I work with a lot of people who are homeless and suicide and it can grip you. But even if you think you're taking it, I know people who's had a great life, great upbringing, take it maybe a few lines, a few grams of coke on a Saturday night, but that few grams can surely go a Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and it can grip you. So yeah. it's a thin, a very thin line to say people um, just take it at festivals and nightclubs. I just think there's a better way to enjoy life and have a more healthier, natural, organic life than hiding from the pain, basically. Yeah. But it comes down to individual choice, doesn't it? An individual choice becomes very, very important because how what people do with their own mind and body really needs to be about their own personal liberty. And when the government decides that, that no one's allowed to do that, then the illicit market is created. So some people want to use cannabis. Some people want to use alcohol. Some people use cannabis because they, they don't like alcohol. And actually, cannabis is the safer choice when you compare the two. Yeah. But you know, I, there's, I don't, I don't want to take 
drugs, but I want people to have the freedom. And if they are going to do them, I want them to survive it. I want it to be as safe as possible. Now, I'll give you an example of a, of a regulated drug. Tobacco is regulated. It is, according to any drug counsellor that you'll speak to, more addictive and difficult to quit than anything. We now have the lowest smoking rate in the UK since 1940. And that's only possible because it's a regulated product, because we have some control over how it's sold, the price, who it's sold to. And because it's a regulated product that you know exactly what's in it, you can also have advice on the label. You can have advertising campaigns telling you what it's doing to you. But you can only do that if you've found a way to live with it. And that's what we need to do with the, the other less dangerous drugs. So what would you say was less dangerous drugs? Less dangerous than tobacco. Yeah. Well, in terms of the deaths and harms, they're, they're all less dangerous than tobacco. All of them. Because of the cancer rates and... Yeah, and other, and other health problems. And looking at the science, all of the drugs are less dangerous than alcohol. And the evidence I refer to for that is a 2007 uh, report in The Lancet, um, the scientific journal from Professor David Nutt. And he did um, a, a new way of comparing drug harms. And he, there's a lot of detail to it. And it quite clearly showed that the most dangerous drug is alcohol. Heroin is dangerous. Yeah. Cocaine is dangerous. But then the sliding scale goes quickly down. So at the bottom end, you've got very little harm for things like uh, magic mushrooms, LSD, psychedelics, M MDMA. MDMA, for example. Yeah, it's supposed to be good for the brain. MDMA is not banned because it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it's banned. So 74 people in the UK died of MDMA last year. Every single one of those deaths is because it's a non-regulated product. People deserve to have safe products. They deserve to have the right um advice so understand what you're saying you're saying the drugs should be more health and safety checked if it were legalized then there'd be more checked would it be less deaths yes absolutely because people are still going to take them because uh, i do a lot we do a lot of studying on like, psychedelics again with the, the dmt and um, the mushrooms and it can open the mind the pineal gland same with the ayahuasca i'm drug free but they say ayahuasca is a plant base where you take it and because of the DMT in it, it's like 10, 20 years of therapy where it brings all the trauma to the surface. And um, they say it's a, the medical cure, apparently the shortcut. But for me, anything you take externally is still, it's still a drug. Uh, do you know what I mean? It's, it's still difficult. So what would you say for like um, weed, for instance? How would you feel as if they legalise weed in the UK? Well, I think it's uh, it's urgent, actually. It's urgent that we, we regulate all the drugs because... The, the illicit market for drugs is corrupting our entire system. It's corrupting the whole society. It's corrupting the police, the legal system. Uh, people are dying. And pe less people will die if all the drugs are regulated. So, yeah, start with cannabis, definitely. There's between various estimates, but between three and five million people using cannabis probably in the UK. And if you look at it this way, homosexuality used to be illegal in this country. It used to be illegal. People got to prison for it. And that's not so distant in our past. The illegality ended and the stigma started to go. And now, generally, we accept it's not cool to be prejudiced against people who are gay. Yeah? There are significantly, there are probably twice as many people using cannabis than there are homosexuals in this country. So we're talking about a lot of people who make a personal choice about their own health and their own body. Should we be prejudiced against those people or should we just make things as safe as possible for them? I think it's, it's trying to make everything as safe as possible, but I also think it's good to make people understand there is more things in life that you can do to get to a higher state. Meditation, breathing exercises takes you to a higher state than other drugs as well. And it's more natural. And I've said it in many podcasts, the scientists did a study on sex, alcohol, psychedelics and meditation. And meditation was the only one that took you to a higher state and it was internal. So I think more people need to understand meditation and even breathing techniques. Breathing more, it sends better oxygen to the brain, the gut, where you can handle more anxiety, fear, depression. So it's trying to understand having balance, but it's scary to think that the majority of people don't understand balance. They don't understand moderation. 
Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And I do agree with you. Uh, and learning about moderation is important. But at the moment, that conversation is impossible because the conversation is you're not allowed to do that. Do you think if drugs were legalized, more pe less people would take them? I think uh, when when if drugs were all legally regulated, some drugs would be taken significantly less. For example, heroin, the most dangerous of drugs, because you would only ever have a medical model for heroin, like we used to in the UK. You know, there's a time in some people's living memory uh, when we had the, what we call the British system, which was the last resistance to American-style prohibition. And that meant that if you had a problem with heroin, you went to the doctor and you got given heroin. Not methadone, as you mentioned. Methadone is much more harmful to the health than heroin. But what that means is, if you're giving someone heroin from a doctor, it means that there's no incentive for that person to... Well, they're not being exploited by organised crime. And they've not got organised crime trying to get them to find new customers. So we had an epidemic because it was banned. Yeah. So, that, so as soon as you get control of it, you'd have much less people having heroin. You'd have less people using crack cocaine. Yeah, so say that they legalise drugs. Say someone got 20 years today for drug dealing. They legalise drug next week. What would happen to the people who were in prison for drugs? Well, that's a really important question. And I would like to direct it to people who have been arrested for possession. Because an important part of reform is to make sure that those people who've got a criminal record for possessing cannabis, for possessing MDMA, that they have their records expunged because people should not have their job prospects ruined uh, for, a crim for a conviction for drugs. And part of ending that criminalization is to make sure that people don't suffer for this terrible policy that we've had for decades. As for the drug dealing, that's a different conversation because... Um, it's it's difficult to expunge those kind of uh, records. And of course, a lot of people have been involved in violence to do it. So I think you would have to look, you'd have to take time and look at every case individually. Yeah. So when did you, for somebody who went undercover to stop the war on drugs and then to now, like want it legalized for people to understand and health to safety, it's like a, a different flip of the coin. How did that come about? Well, that's because I realized that everything I was doing trying to police drugs was futile. But then I realized that it was actually much worse than futile and that by the action of policing drugs, I was part of the mechanism that was constantly making society more violent. Be drugs being banned means ever increasing violence to control the trade. It's as simple as that. It always has been about that. Same as alcohol prohibition in America. That's why we're getting increase in violence. There are whole sections of community who can't talk to the police because organised crime runs that community. You you know the kind of places I'm talking about. So how do the police treat you now that you're speaking out about this and it's kind of went full circle? How do you, are you like a black sheep? Are you like black ball? Do they speak to you? Are you an outsider? How do you get treated? Well, that's, that's interesting because in 2015, when I first started speaking out, I got, I mean, I got, I was at public enemy number one to the code. For police. criminals and fucking police. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Because as far as as far as far um, sort of drugs covert police was concerned, I was a whistleblower. I was letting secrets out. I mean, that you know, that's a whistleblowing book. I'm I'm admitting to all sorts of stuff in there. Fucking and, yeah. and uh, you know, I was, I was really public enemy number one. Um, a close friend of mine was given a lawful order uh, to never speak to me again. And... They, they ordered her to remove me from her social media and phone at that moment. You know, that's how harsh things were. But things have changed drastically. And actually in the UK, it's police which are leading the reform debate now. Now, I'm part of an international organisation, a rapidly growing international organisation called the Law Enforcement Action Partnership. In the UK, we're called Leap UK. We have members everywhere, former chief constables, other undercover cops like me, former MI5 prison governors. We've got a brilliant um, member in Scotland, Jim Duffy. Um, so there's, there's a lot of us and we're growing. And we've had an influence. And now we've got police and crime commissioners and senior police talking about the same things that we've been saying for years. And you've got a police like in Durham, Cleveland, Birmingham, talking about using policing money to actually prescribe heroin to problematic heroin users to reduce crime, to take the market away from organised crime. You know, this is senior police, this is chief constables talking about this. Yeah. So 
police are actually leading the reform debate. And this is in spite of politicians, not because of them. Yeah. So see when you were undercover as well, did you ever, let's say somebody picked up a parcel, say it was a big parcel or maybe picking up guns. Did you know they were, what they were picking up, but you had to let them go because you knew it was going to lead to even bigger things? Yeah, yeah, quite often. I mean, there's times when I've, I've been uh, threatened with a gun. Uh, in fact, I was told to strip naked by the Burger Bar boys and they lifted up the shirt and showed me this automatic pistol tucked into the trousers. And um, we took the view, actually, to keep quiet about that, to be honest, because we wouldn't, we didn't have the evidence against everyone at that time. And if we'd actually pushed the alarm button and gone chasing them for that gun, we wouldn't have got to the end of the operation. So... There was always that kind of decision. So you had to get all the answers before you could make a move? Yeah. So if you've seen, what happens if you've seen someone murder someone, but yet if there was 100 people that potentially could get to prison, go to prison, and that one murder could jeopardise that whole operation, would that still be pulled the plug on to get the full answers? No, a murder would have pulled the plug on the operation straight yeah. away because there is nothing more serious than a murder. Yeah. So that would have been the end. Of and the what job. about the panic button? Did you have something on you? Were you wired? No. Nothing? No, no. I mean, I I would wear a camera or recording device only once I, I was confident I'd built up some trust uh, with the people. So at the start, you know, I might get searched. I had nothing on me at all, no. Yeah. So mentally, even speaking about it, does it bring back a lot of emotions for you? Do you get anxiety? Do you, do you, or do you feel fine now? Um, I'm, a, I'm a bit on edge, to be honest, but um, it's unpredictable. I mean, PTSD, some days I have a terrible day. Other days I can deal with it absolutely fine. Um, I might struggle a bit tomorrow. <laughs> to yeah, drained. Yeah. Do you take any cannabis oils or for your PTSD? Do you take any some sort I, of? I don't know. I mean, I, I wish that sad cannabis did did suit me, to be honest, um, because I know it helps quite a few other people with PTSD, and I, I wish it did. Unfortunately, I get much more relief from alcohol, so I have to be really careful not to drink too much. Yeah, but certainly when I first got my PTSD symptoms, I was drinking huge amounts, like ridiculous amounts. So I balance it out, kind of forget, kind of. Well, it's surprisingly effective for PTSD. It just, you know, it just numbs it. Yeah, for that present moment. But the next day, the problems are a hundred times worse. There's always that effect. Then, yeah, but I mean, I'd, then I'd have another drink. <laughs> Fucking hell, man. Don't be drinking, people. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it, you know, th that's problematic because mm -hmm. uh, there is there is no more... What about, med what about meditation? What about ayahuasca? Do you know about ayahuasca? I, I do, yeah. It's um, yeah, it's DMT combined with um, with a MAO inhibitor. Yeah. Um, it's Yeah, it's something I might consider at some point. Well, I went to Costa Rica there um, and we made a documentary on ayahuasca. Like I say, I've worked with people who are suicidal and who are homeless. Some people kind of just, I made the changes and the sacrifices within me. I, I did it myself, but some, it's difficult. Some people need that wee push or they say ayahuasca is a shortcut. Ayahuasca is a tea for anybody watching. It's a tea. You drink the ceremony we were in had like 60, 70 people. You take the tea and for eight hours, they say all your pain and trauma comes to the surface and you deal with it all. They say it's a shortcut to depression, anxiety. The people who were in the documentary who are heroin addicts, um, suicidal, a lot of cancer patients as well, who they say ayahuasca can... They, they, they say this tea's been here for thousands and thousands of years. It's a plant-based medicine that um, it changes life. They say, this is three, four weeks ago I did it, they say this is when you start feeling the effects. For me personally, I've still not had that miracle yet or that effect where you're supposed to feel enlightened. They say it reconnects you with your soul. A lot of people who did the ayahuasca are in a great place just now. They're feeling amazing, the best they've ever felt. A lot of people with PTSD. It's, um, is that a medical plan? Is it a, For yet, I don't know. For yet, the answers will be when I follow those people up in two, three months to see if they're still in a good place. Is a placebo effect kick into play also where they're believing it so much that they can trick their brain into believing that they're cured, which is a great thing also. So, yeah, and I'm hoping that if these people can, then maybe ayahuasca or something like yourself can, because it, it, it's fucking scary. When I was taking ayahuasca, I was in hell for two or three days. I was in seeing fire, the ceiling opened, I seen a lot of misery and pain, but they say you take on your ancestors' pain, your family's pain, and you release it all. It's funny because I've actually, me and my mum used to quite argue and fight quite a lot, but since I've been back, it's been, 
it's been the calmest it's been in, in many, many years. Maybe that's one of the factors, I don't know. But well, That's interesting. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that's potentially, I don't know if it is the miracle, but a lot of people seem to be going towards it more and more and more. Well, it, it's interesting because you, you back up my point that drug use is a natural human thing and that it's been humans have done it for thousands of years in, in various means, you know, whether it's people chewing the, chewing the coca leaf in South America or people taking ayahuasca. But in terms of psychedelics, there's now lots of good scientific evidence that many of them have um, benefits. So psilocybin, for example, has had some success in treating what, what's called untreatable depression. And that's remarkable because it's, pe it's, it's rescuing people from a constant hell. Um, and there is evidence that that works. So it's got, it's now being licensed for further yeah. for production. Again, there is always shortcuts, but there's men like a guy called Joe Dispenza who works on the mindset, who believes the mind can change anything in your body just with the belief and the, the consistency of believing and tricking the brain. The brain doesn't know what's real or fake. So you can trick your brain into re-energizing, refocusing. Even but if you look at monks or if you look at other people who meditate every day, they don't take the other stuff to get that enlightenment either. So there's always, go no matter what we sit and talk, there's always going to be both sides of the coin. Oh, totally, and, yeah. And it's what works for anybody. I'm not, it's what works for you. But as long as you're not hurting anybody, as long as you're, you're feeling great from it. And you're, if you're going, listen, we're human beings. If you have two bad days like you're going to have tomorrow, then go and have three and four good days. Mm. Everything in your mind, I believe a lot of people concentrate on the things they haven't got instead of the things they have got. But going through a trauma like yourself and a lot of people who are homeless, have got PTSD from yeah. who've been in the army, police officers. Um, it's a whole list of different people with different backgrounds. You also said that your life was in danger a few times undercover. How close were you were to getting killed? Oh, really close. I mean, I've had a samurai sword to my throat and knives, threatened with knives many times. I suppose the closest was, though, uh, when I was in Leicester, um, it was right at the end of the operation and a gangster I'd bought heroin from right at the start. I'd not got him on camera because I hadn't been wearing a camera at that point. So I wanted to get him out, but he wasn't dealing hands-on. He was sending other people out. So I thought, well, I'll tempt him out by getting some counterfeit clothing. So I got some fake Stone Island jackets, got hold of the true customs and uh, put a phone call in. It says, look, I've got these jackets here, interested in. So he came to meet me. He knew me, he trusted me. But the trouble is he bought two of his mates with him to see these jackets. I was in this secluded car park in Leicester. And uh, he says, well, you know, do you just want to sell these jackets or do you want something while you're here? And I says, well, I'll have some white if you're carrying white. So he gets this massive block of, cr of crack, which is like bigger than a VHS uh, box, sits in the front of his car and starts carving it up. In the meanwhile, one of his mates looks me up and down and says, hey, how long have you known him? He's suddenly suspicious of me. And he starts pushing me up against this wall and starts searching my clothes. And it's not James Bond tech. It's not that sophisticated. He looks in this button and he finds the camera in the button. I think I'm in trouble here. And he says, Spoonie, man, he's 5-0. He's fucking heat, man. And I always look at these people thinking, you're not, you're not old enough to have seen Hawaii 5-0. Why are you calling <laughs> me 5-0? I have no idea. But anyway, he says, he's 5-0, man. He's fucking heat. So what I did is, I knew that if he could convince the guy that knew me in the car that I was a cop, I was, I was dead. So I just launched into this abusive tirade at him. I says, what are you fucking doing? Picking up my clothes, you fucking this, and just swearing at him. Took the jacket off him and started folding it really slowly, really slow, putting it in the bag and constant stream of abuse. So he couldn't get a word in edgeways, but also he's a bit stunned thinking, hang on, have I seen what I've seen? What's going on here? I didn't expect this. Response. Mind fucked him. Yeah, mind fucked him, yeah. So I carried on with his stream and I walked as slowly as I could, giving him this abuse, walking away. Because I know if I ran, you know, you run away from walls and they run after you. Yeah. I was being really, really slow. And I got halfway across this car park and I heard this running behind me thinking, oh, he's managed to convince him. I'm thinking if I could just get one punch in and then leg it. But I turn around and it's the gangster that I know. And he says, oh, don't mind my mate, he's a dickhead. Don't you want this ting? I'm thinking you really want to sell me crack now. Anyway, I said, yeah, you mate, it is a dickhead and he's been picking up my clothes. It's not even my jacket. And I give him this 20 quid. It's all captured on the camera, you know, the exchange. And his mate is screaming at him. 
I'm telling you, he's fucking 5 0. He's got a camera. But obviously, he's not listening. So he starts going back to the car. I'm thinking, I can't believe I've got away with this. Anyway, I got near to the entry exit of the car park and hear the squealing of the wheels. I'm thinking, oh, okay, he's convinced him now. And this car comes zooming after me. So I think, well, I've just got to leg it now. I get to the road and onto this pavement and I start running towards the traffic island. And um, you know where I, the traffic island splits and you get a metal barrier mm -hmm. separating? I thought, I'll just sprint for that. And this car is coming after me up the pavement, just zooming after me. And I get to this metal railing and it screech, screeches and it stops about a centimetre from the railing. It must have been within a metre of hitting me. So then I carried on walking, thinking, oh, I've, got, I've got away from them. And they're going round the roundabout and revving the engine. Uh, but then for quite a short distance, I could cut across to a pedestrian area. So I was quite safe quite quickly. So I got back um, to the safe location, the, the debrief site, and, um, you know, told the team, told the intel guy, the, the car registration number, the description. He went away. A few moments later, he came back laughing. He says, oh, I don't know why they didn't, just didn't shoot you. Because there's loads of intelligence that they've got a gun in that car. So, um, so yeah. That did was, that, that was frighten you, though? Did that not think, what the fuck am I doing? Oh, it terrified me. God, yeah, yeah. That, was, that, was a, that, was, um, that was a genuinely scary day. Did you ever wear disguises, like the fake moustaches, the wigs? Did you do that stuff, or was it just the way you look just now, just different clothes? Just different clothes, yeah. I mean, you know, when I first started, I used to dress a bit like a scally. Do you have that word in Scotland? Scally? Yeah, 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 yeah. So I dress, dressed like a scally, um, like full tracky, um, Nike Air Max trainers, you know, mm. no disrespect to anyone listening to this who's really into their sportswear. I've got Nike Air Max one just now. <laughs> Bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Coppers, I never trust them. <laughs> yeah. But, but you know, that was in the early days. But then later on, I sort of, I, I found that actually I got more intros if I looked like I was really struggling and living in squats yeah. and things like that. So. so did you ever work alone? Was it always alone? Was, did you ever have a partner? Most of the time I worked alone uh, and I preferred to work alone, to be honest, because, you know, you can be in charge of, mm -hmm. you know exactly what you're going to say if you're on your own. You don't have to account for what someone else says. Yeah. Having said that, I did work with other people at times and I worked with some extremely talented people as well. Very talented. Yeah. So obviously going through all that life, what made you quit? What was the, the breaking point? What was your catalyst to go, fuck this, enough's enough? I worked in Brighton. And I got a vision of the future in Brighton because the cops down there were unpleasant, uh, bullying characters. You know, I've worked with some good professional people around the country. I got to Brighton and they, would, they were not professional at all. They'd been overusing the tactic to the point where organized crime had adapted. And they, what they'd done to adapt is they were using homeless people as their point of contact. And what they were saying to the homeless people is, you bring anyone near to us, who we don't know, and we're going to kill you. And they were telling people who they already had killed. And they were naming people who died of, who'd been listed as dying of overdoses. Now, I can't say for sure that there were casual murders going on. What I can say is that the overdose rates in Brighton were higher than anywhere else in the country by a long way. And there were lots of people on the streets who were convinced there were casual murders going on just to control people and intimidate people. And um, I could see quite clearly then when I reviewed the work that I'd done through my undercover career that this was a situation created by policing drugs. There was no, that, violence wasn't there until we tried harder and ramped up the drug war. And it's never, it's never going to end. Until we legally regulate drugs, that violence is never going to end. The corruption is never going to end. And I, I found myself in an untenable position. How can I carry on in the police? You know, I tried, I, st I stopped undercover work and I stayed in the police for a while. I became a detective sergeant. Um, but I just became more and more troubled by the fact that I'd, I'd come to these conclusions. I understood this. I understood that the problems was caused by prohibition of drugs. You know, it, we got the chicken and the egg the wrong way around. We've caused this problem. And understanding that, I, I just found myself in an untenable position and the stress got too much. Yeah, I think it was more back to front then, the kind of things that were going on and um, where, where becomes the good guys and the bad guys anymore, you kind of get lost and kind of go, 
what the fuck am I doing? You question everything. You question everything. Everything, yeah, absolutely. Because, you know, so much of policing is about drug policy. You know, you arrest a burglar who's got a problem with heroin. And actually, I know that if he'd been prescribed heroin, he wouldn't be burgling. If you looked after him and prescribed that drug to him, he wouldn't have broken into someone's house. And you made a good point earlier on that about exploiting vulnerable people. You know, the vulnerable people are being exploited by the criminals and the police. I exploited the same people the gangsters were exploited. And they're people caught in the crossfire. And there's, we don't need to do this. We can do things differently. We know we can do things differently. So what do you think then we should do then? Do you think it should, for educating people, because edu knowledge is power, um, educating people should we start at the schooling to understanding things a bit more for kids to maybe have a better opportunities and understanding uh, we, what age do we speak about drugs at school? Do we even speak about drugs in secondary school? Maybe the, the, the latter years, maybe when you're 15, 16, should we be t getting teaching kids as young as five and six? The, about drinking drugs and the risks and the health and safety and stuff like that and getting a better understanding of, of life. Do you think maybe schooling should change some, the curriculum? Curriculum, how do you say that word? Curriculum. Curriculum. Yeah. Curriculum. <laughs> do you think that should maybe, some things should get put in place to change, to educate the kids for a better future? Yes, quite definitely. But it comes back to legal regulation. We can only educate about drugs when we know what's in the drugs. Because otherwise, if, unless you regulate drugs, education just comes down to just say no. And we know that just say no doesn't work. So what we need to teach people is harm reduction. We need to pe teach people to make healthy choices. And you can only do that if you know what's in the drugs. You can only do that about MDMA, really, if you can buy it from a licensed pharmacy and you know that each dose is 0.86 uh, uh, of, a, of a gram. You can only do that if you've got the right... Um, labeling you, you can only do that you can only start talking to the kids about that if you've got a regulated product but if they regulate it do you not think there's always somebody from the darker side who would make another drug that wouldn't be legalized that's stronger and fuck you up more just to to get more involved and do you know what I mean? The kind of operation or opportunity? Well, no. Well, no, actually, because there's clear evidence that, that where a regulated drug is available, people will use the safer commodity. Um, so for, I'll give you an example of where a dirty drug, the market for a dirty drug would disappear or, or for the most part disappear, and that's spice. Now, spice, synthetic cannabinoids, is a product of the prohibition of cannabis. If cannabis had legally been legally regulated 15 years ago, there would be no spice on our streets. It was created as a cheap alternative to cannabis. It's become much more. I mean, it's not, it's not anything like cannabis now. It's an extreme drug. But, you know, people die from spice. If, if people really did want to do spice, there are versions of spice which don't kill people. Yeah. Why do you think the death rate in Scotland is at the all-time high just now on drugs? Well, I would say that Westminster policy, centralised policy, has got a lot to do with it. And Scotland, like most nations, has its own particular problems with drugs. And Scotland needs to be able to control its own drug policy, I would say. It's, it's an aspect of government which needs devolving. Mm -hmm. Now, Scotland have taken decisions or wanted to take decisions that evidence says would, would save lives. So, for example, they wanted a drug consumption room in Glasgow. All the evidence is there to support that a drug consumption route would save lives and help people get into services. It's a way of taking care of people. But that decision was blocked by Westminster. It was blocked by the English government. Yeah, it's scary. But again, success leaves clues. In Portugal, I'll lead them by example. Their crime rate, their, their addiction issues have dropped massively. Yes. The biggest in the world. So why are we not following the footsteps of places like Portugal? It's... Politicians are nervous of calling are, are for. Are they just greedy? I don't. I don't know. I mean, I've I've got to know a lot of politicians, and I have a very old-fashioned view about politicians. As they're good politicians, to be honest, I don't know what I see. I just don't think there's enough help for people, and they can ch make the changes to get the help for people. Well, there there are good politicians in the UK now. There are good ones in England. There are good ones in Scotland. Ronnie Cowan, for example, is one example of a brilliant one in in Scotland. He's the MP for Inverclyde, okay. and he's a fantastic advocate. Uh, for drug law reform.
Uh, and there are there are many others cross party. You know, it's not it does this issue doesn't belong to one party. And there are growing numbers of politicians who are looking at the example of Portugal and and my organisation Leap UK. We spend a lot of time speaking to politicians, and what we can do is we give a politician confidence because you know we you've, if if the cops are saying it, you know we've got their backs, haven't we? It backs up what they're saying. So there is a shift in politics. Portugal is a good example, and the, and the most important aspect of Portugal is that they used to have drug deaths higher than Scotland. Now they only have three deaths per million. In the in the UK overall, we have sort of sixty deaths per million. Yeah. So that's an enormous difference. So we should be following them straight away. But what I would say is that Portugal is not the perfect system because organised crime still still runs the supply. You know, people don't get sent to prison. It's, it's decriminalized, so possession doesn't get people a criminal record, but people still have to go to gangsters to buy them. and st yeah. So they still have the corruption, mm -hmm. and, you know, that corruption is only going in one direction. The changes, making changes can put an effect of driving numbers down. Glasgow was, I think, murder capital or knife capital of Europe and maybe five, six years ago, a few years back, and they've massively dropped those numbers. So making changes... It does come into effect, but they need to make the changes now in Scotland and yeah. England because people are losing their life. There's a young girl in Glasgow, 16, 17, ecstasy, dead. Um, and that shit's scary. It scares me because I took so many drugs when I was young. I don't think they're as strong now. But it's scary because I fear for my kids. I fear for them to see all these kids and, if, and it just they think they're having a good time and it's scary to fucking get that phone call to say you've lost a loved one. So for yourself, Neil, going forward for the future, obviously you're an activist and you're doing you're doing great things. And I'm quite surprised actually. Um, obviously the undercover stuff to making that and speaking so openly and honestly. So going forward for the future, what do you see yourself doing and what changes would you like to see in place? I mean, going. I mean, my future. I see a future of just continuing to campaign um, for whatever incremental change we can get. You know, uh, we heroin-assisted treatment, heroin prescribing. We want urgently. Drug consumption rooms. We need urgently. Legalizing the cannabis market, regulating it urgently to protect children from the drug and to protect children from organized crime. And then we need to regulate the rest. You know, MDMA. That that. The girl, 17-year-old who died in Scotland, uh, was it Tea in the Park? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like... Um, One of the... Transmat, I think. Yeah, that's it. Um, that's happening too often, and that would not happen if the drugs were regulated. So this is this is urgent. People are dying now. Um, so you know, my, my organisation will keep expanding and we will keep speaking to politicians, but actually more important than politicians is the social movement. So I mentioned the social movement to end the criminalizing of homosexuality earlier. There's a very clear parallel here. That didn't that law didn't change because politicians decided from the top. That law changed because of social movement from the bottom. And the same thing is going to happen with drug law reform. So if anyone out there finds himself agreeing with me and agreeing with Leap UK that we need to regulate the drug supply. We need drug law reform. We need decriminalization. We need to save lives. Then please support us on social media. Um, what is your social media? Well, on, on Twitter and Instagram, we are at UK Leap. Okay. Uh, on Facebook, we are Leap UK. We'll put uh, the links for people to see under, um, on the video. So Great. So, I mean, support us and... Just try and pass this on and explain to other people. Please do read the books, but use them use them as a tool because that's why I did them really. Yeah. Well, the your, your first book. Um, that's the first one. The first book, Good Cop, Bad War. Um, give me a wee bit of intro for this for people to go and buy it. Well, that's a memoir. That's that's all of the the dangerous situations I got into, um, the people I met, all, all the things that happened to me, and and you know the reasons why I came to the conclusions that I did. Drug wars is um, it, it? It's a history. Of, oh, is that a whistleblowing book? No, that's the whistleblowing book. Is a good cop bad one? Yeah, the first cops, book? yeah, that's the first one. Drug. There is some whistleblowing in drug wars because mm. there's a chapter from a guy called Frank Matthews who explains about the extent of police corruption. Um, but that's a history book essentially. Mm -hmm. But they're both tools, really. I mean, thankfully, people have told me that they enjoy them, which is good. 
Mm-hmm. Um, but they're tools and it's information that you can use to help grow that social movement. Yeah, because I was um, obviously I knew you were coming on. I've been watching a lot of your stuff. There's so many videos you've out there speaking out and being open and honest. It's uh, it's refreshing. Also, obviously, it's um, sitting by next undercover copper and doing this kind of stuff. It is. It's it's good that you try to awaken people and try to help people from the drug culture, especially in the other life that you were in. That you were in. Um, Give me one of the stories from this bit, a quick story to get people intrigued. Okay. Drug um, wars. Well, I told you about Frank Matthews, the guy who um, who had to run away from the Met because he was whistleblowing and corrupt cops. But I'll tell you something, that, which um, there's a chapter where we wanted to try and make it clear to people the cause and effect of banning drugs and how, it's, what, how the change has happened over time. So we went to Liverpool and we interviewed three gangsters uh, from Liverpool. One was a right-hand man of Curtis Warren, famous gangster, first one who got into the Sunday Times rich list as a gangster. But of course, um, organised crime have got better at hiding their money since then. Um, so he got into dealing heroin in the 1970s. Second one got into organised crime in the 1990s, end of the, end of the 90s when organised crime became more corporate and international, a bit more slick. And the third one was a 16-year-old boy who had escaped county lines drug dealing and perhaps the most interesting question we asked these three the first one we said we asked them each of them how easy was it for you to get a gun as a young bloke getting into organized crime and the first one said well i could have asked and i could have got taken to the higher ups that was his phrase not mine could have gone to the higher ups and i would have had to explain exactly why i needed a gun and they would have listened to me patiently and then they would have said no don't be so stupid. Why would you want to draw attention to yourself and to me by using a gun? If you've got a beef with someone, go toe-to-toe with them. Fight it out. Second gangster, next generation. He says, well, we knew that if we had a beef with another another gang, you know, if some, someone over territory or something, we knew we had automatic weapons we'd get to if we had to. But we'd never let youngsters have them. That would be stupid. So a 16-year-old, he said, well, I'd need a couple of hours. In fact, he said, the last time I needed a gun, I went to the guy and he says, oh, I've just sold my last one for today. Um, But I've got a hand grenade if you want that. And he says, oh yeah, okay then. He was 15 at the time and he took that hand grenade home and had it in his sock drawer, ready to deal with the next person who came to his house. And and that was just a territorial disagreement over drug dealing territory. The reason he wanted a gun is because someone had come into his house and slashed his father across the face, almost cut his eye out can't go to the police because he's part of that community. Mm -hmm. So we've gone in a time in some people's living memory from heroin being controlled by a doctor with a prescription pad to 15 year olds with hand grenades. And so we can show quite clearly the change over time, the cause and effect. There was no problem with drugs until they were banned. And if we treat it as a health issue, then those problems will really go away. Yeah, fingers crossed. And do you has anybody you ever put away ever spoke to you? Maybe try. It, it might sound crazy, but anybody you've ever put away for drugs, and obviously the work you're doing now to highlight it. Have you ever been in contact with anybody to maybe for them to change their life to maybe start working with you to also help with the problem that we have just now? Yeah, I've spoken to a lot. I haven't. I haven't spoken to anyone who I've put inside. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be interesting. Um, I, I would like to someday, um, but I, I have met with lots of pe- people who are former prisoners, loads of people who are former drug dealers who who are very helpful. Um, you know, we're we're on the same side. We we want to explain to people the reality of these things and um, try and get some policy changes. So yeah. yeah, we'll work we'll work with anybody. Yeah, and it's good, man. And uh, no matter even the criminals have ha- I've had on who've had dodgy past, there's always messages in the podcast for people to pick up and listen to. I don't glorify anyone. I don't certainly fucking make it as if this is a life to be, but there's always messages for people to pick up, whether spiritually, mentally, physically. If you listen clearly, there's always messages. And I think, obviously, with the route we're going down, what do you see? Do you see the problem getting worse just now before it gets better? Do you see things going to need to start to change drastically? I believe the power of the people, the voice of the people is so powerful. If everybody gets together and starts making a statement that okay we've got a problem here we need to stick by each other do you think 
from now is going to get even worse or do you think things need to fucking make changes now to progress and help people to better their life? Well, I mean, in terms of drug policy, it's urgent. We need change now. We need it. Uh, but it is, I'm afraid it is going to get worse. And what's going to get worse is the exploitation of children. The county lines, you know, you've heard of county yeah. lines. I mean, you, you know, you could get Liverpool kids going up to Aberdeen to deal heroin and crack. Mm. Um, that's going to get worse. And it's the tip of the iceberg now. There's there's an estimated 10,000 kids doing this. Now... In the UK? In the UK, yeah. Now, we have to understand that it's part of the cause and effect. We have to. That the reason organised crime are exploiting children, well, that's my fault as well. That's my fault. That's the fault of people like me. Because the police are good at catching drug dealers. When I caught the Burger Bar boys, I caught all those 96 people. They were all adults. They were all hands-on with the money. They went to, they, some of them went to jail for 10 years apiece. So the natural strategic response to that kind of police success is to exploit children. Because children can't be infiltrated by normal police informants. They can't be as easily influ in, infiltrated by undercover cops. They're disposable, they're easily, easily manipulated, and they're cheap labour. That would not have happened if police hadn't had those series of successes. You know, the first drug dealers when the Misuse of Drugs Act came in in the 1970s, they weren't thinking, oh, one day we'll all be exploiting kids. They'd have laughed at you. They wouldn't have thought that would happen. But it was still, inev it was still inevitable. And that's what we have to understand. When we see these terrible things happening, it's a natural progression over time. Things will always get worse until we take power away from organised crime by regulating the drug markets. Yeah. Neil... It's been an absolute pleasure. Your stories is phenomenal. It's, a, it's been a roller coaster. Um, where can people buy your books? All of the normal outlets. Um, Amazon. Uh, Amazon. Uh, Kindle. Uh, yeah, well, any of them really, any yeah. of the major bookstores. Would you like to finish up on anything before we go? Um, just to reiterate, please pass this on. Please get people talking about it. And if you agree, please support us. Perfect, Neil. And listen, thanks for taking the time to come down, brother. And, uh, good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you. 